All right, folks, we are going to go ahead and get started. So welcome to our third Daughterhood Conversation. Um, we are going to be talking today about caregiving, stereotypes, and race. So um, a couple of things I just want to uh, flag for you in terms of housekeeping. So we are going to mute your video and your audio so that um, everybody can see uh, our two panelists or guests today. And my recommendation is the best way to watch this is on speaker view. Um, and, but you can obviously play with it however you want. Um, and then please feel free to share your thoughts, questions, comments, experiences in the chat function throughout. We will try really hard to address questions that come in or react or respond or have a dialogue around those things as much as possible. So, um, so anyway, I just, you know, we have launched Daughterhood Conversations so that we can uh, share the expertise we have in this incredible group of people who are our Daughterhood Circle leaders. And um, in case, just, but just as quick background in case you are, oh, so the video is being recorded. I'm going to tell you that. <laughs> And um, in case you're not familiar with Daughterhood, we're a community that brings people together solely for the purpose of supporting each other through the joys and challenges of caring for aging parents and other family members and friends. So that's our, you know, our mission really is just to support and build confidence in the women in particular, but also men who are managing their parents' care. Um, I do want to flag for you. Oh, I should just say, if you're interested in the Daughterhood Circle Circle program and either being a leader or joining a circle, please just head over to our website at um, which is daughterhood.org and you will see a circle tab and you can click on that and you can see all of the circles that we have available and when they're meeting and who our leaders are. So, so that's a program we have for you and I, I really encourage everybody to take advantage of it. We also have an amazing podcast led by Roseanne Corcoran and um, she's is phenomenally talented and we are so lucky and she talks to a lot of different types of people and experts um, and provides just an enormous resource and source of information for the daughterhood community um, so our daughterhood conversations are uh, every month but almost every month and we try to host them live but then we also take these and um, turn them into recordings and put them on YouTube so that everybody can have access to them. We have such a special group of Daughterhood Circle leaders all over the country. I think if there's just one thing that I am the most proud of with respect to Daughterhood, it's this incredible community of community leaders who come together all from across the country and we share with each other our expertise so that we can all take that back to our local communities and and kind of spread the wisdom as broadly as possible and in, in doing so we have this idea I think it might have been Regina's idea <laughs> that we um that we need to Regina has a lot of really good ideas but um that we need to bring this expertise you know kind of out to to share with our broader daughterhood community directly and give our daughterhood circle leaders just a chance to be in conversation with each other and with you in real time. So let me just tell you a little bit, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Regina and Jerry and it's not even gonna remotely do them justice. Um, Regina is a leader of our daughterhood circle in Indianapolis. Um, she, she is an expert, like so many of our leaders, she is an expert in the field. And she has been working in healthcare and caregiving for 30 years right now. She, and she has been a caregiver for her mother um, who passed away last April of COVID-19. So she has been in the thick of that and knows what that's all about. She is a vice president of people operations, which is a perfect job for Regina. <laughs> Independent adult day centers where she is responsible for community engagement, staff development and training, which basically are just the hardest possible jobs in all of long-term care. So, um, so she's, she's amazing. Um, Jerry is a leader of our Northeast Atlanta Daughterhood Circle and is, she is an entrepreneur. She is 
you, as you all will be able to tell, and incredibly also somebody who is actively involved in engaging communities and connecting individuals to purposeful and impactful living. She's the owner of her own company, Right Start Administrative and Consulting Services, and an owner and an artist of all things creative. She cares full time for her father who has very, very complex needs and, and long-term care needs, medical, medical and long-term care. So yeah. I could go on, their bios are on the website. I highly recommend that you go and check those out. Um, and you know what, I should have actually had their pictures up this whole time, but you can also see them on the screen. So <laughs> um, before we get started, um, so anyway, just go check out their, check out their um, bios on our website because you will be blown away and impressed. And so we are, I can't, I'm just, I love talking to these women. So I am just going to sit here today and talk and listen and you, you all will get to be the benefit beneficiaries of that. So um, again, if you have questions, key them into the chat function. And, you know, if you have a question about your parents' care, uh, you can just send it into our website on the, the contact and page. And we try to get back to everybody who has a question. It's, it's not so overwhelming that we can't manage it. And we learn a lot from your questions. So, um, so please get in touch with us. Okay, so I'm gonna stop with the slides now. And, <laughs> and again, sort of recommend that if you are watching this now, you will benefit from having it on speaker view. So you won't see all of the, all of the, um, all of the, all of the mini, mini um, little boxes of all the other people. So, okay. So I want to, I want to go ahead and that's enough housekeeping and explanation. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, and um, I am going to just, I'm going to kick this over to Regina for a few minutes and just say, um, so this idea for daughterhood conversations, as I mentioned earlier, came from you. And we were on a Zoom call with um, with the other leaders, and you said, "You said I want to talk about racial stereotypes and caregiving." So, can you just talk about when you said that? What was on your mind? Yes. Hello, everyone. So, um, I, first of all, I saw the Darterhood advertisement on Facebook, and I was like, "Whoa! I've got to join this group." Um, because I had just recently lost my mom. I needed connection. I needed community. I needed healing. And so um, I reached out to the Indianapolis chapter and that was the, the um, co-facilitators that, co that facilitate with me and to, hey, can I tag along? Um, I want to help bring along some African-American daughters who are in the same boat that I'm in. I know a lot of daughters who lost their mom through COVID. And we just, we don't know how to cope. But the bigger picture was we went through um, a rough time in trying to navigate a healthcare system that just did not um, complement us. And so I thought this would be an uh, uh, awesome opportunity to bring awareness to the African-American community, to son, not only just daughters, but sons and daughters, because even when uh, with me caring for my mom, I did have some help with my brother who was also part caregiver with me. And so it's not just a, a woman's platform. It's, it's, a, it's a platform for sons and daughters, but um, just to have that help and support um, to care for your loved one, you're not alone. To let the world, the African-American culture know you don't have to do this alone. And so um, that I tagged on, I jumped on this platform. So our first encounter was, hey, can I represent my community on this platform? And to be honest, that first, that first meeting, I thought, no, I cannot, because I was the only African-American face there. But I tell you, I got off that call that night feeling so connected, so healed, um, so on the path to understanding healthcare in a whole different light. And so I'm glad I joined. I'm glad I'm here. And so I want to continue to be that light and focus and, and, and inspiration and not only just inspiration, but um, a resource and revenue and conduit for others um, 
in the African American yeah. space. You know, um, you, I hear you when you said you were the only African American face on that call. And I remember thinking at the time, Regina is the only African American face on this call, and that's not good. Like, <laughs> what are we going to do about that? And then when you were like, I want to use this platform. I was like, oh, thank goodness. Yes, <laughs> we really need, we need to do that. Like we have to make this a priority. Well, and, and that's the thing, you know, you, you, you open up saying about how I'm always coming up with ideas and I, and I am, I, I can, I can come up with an event in the middle of the night. I mean, I can, I can plan something. I, I, I'm a dreamer, but I'm also a doer and I'm a, I'm a huge visionary and I love to give life to the visions that, that God gives me. And so with that, um, I have a big presence. I like to um, cultivate relationships. So I, I'm just believing, even on our Indiana um, support group, um, we have them, we have a lot of people on our roster, but I can honestly say it is the African-American culture that shows up each week. Yeah. So I'm glad that we're making that presence. I'm glad that um, that that was the whole purpose of me joining so that I can show that we are not alone and that caregiving comes to all of us. Um, may Culturally, the experience is different because we, we are, I know we're going to talk about um, the challenges that we get into as far as the system is concerned, but I think caring for someone you love I don't care what your ethnicity is; it can still it can be the same. And so, um, yeah. I, I think the embrace that I have felt from daughterhood has been so welcoming and so warm. And so, oh, I'm, I'm so glad. Yeah, I'm, I want other. I want to be able to share that. I want to take that from off of our Zoom calls into the community. I want us to break ground and and do something very. Uh, abnormal. I want us to do something abnormal. I want us to change <laughs> how healthcare is really presented. And so, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we have an opportunity right now. I really do. And, and just having this conversation, I think is going to go a long way. This and others, we have to keep having these conversations and keep putting that voice out there and elevating it so that other people in your community and all our communities can see it. I think one of the things that you said, and and Jerry, you really echoed this too, was that you know in the African American culture there is a strong um, sort of sense of of duty and pressure, especially for women, about you know taking care of their families. So you've got, you know, you're dealing with. Some of the things, you know, there's so many unifying things about caregiving, but there are also things that are different about your experience that, um, and, you know, I'm interested in your thoughts about like that, that pressure that you felt and, um, and, you know, Jerry, I think, I, I think you put it like, uh, like there's no, there's not a lot of room to ask for help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, um, I have been involved with uh, Daughterhood since the summer of 2019 um, when I joined the Northeast, Northeast Atlanta uh, Daughterhood Circle and with, with no intentions on taking any leadership roles <laughs> because for me, it was just like, I just, I'm a caregiver. I, you know, and I think when it comes to caregiving, like all the other titles don't matter. You know, who I am in the community doesn't matter. Right now I'm a daughter taking care of my dad. And that's the common language that you have within the daughterhood circle. Um, we're daughters taking care of our parents. Um, and so that's just where I wanted to live when I first came to daughterhood. Um, and of course, the more I got involved, the more the conversations went on, you know, it's natural for me to want to assist. And um, <laughs> with, with, with Carolyn, um, the leader for Northeast Atlanta, you know, we share each other's burdens. And so when I could see where she was, you know, caught up in life and, you know, needed a reminder to be sent out to the group, I, you know, sent her a little text like, hey, you want me to send that out? And so uh, we wind up having a conversation about, she was like, you know, would you consider being a co-leader? And I was like, I was going to ask you, if you need help with something, let me know. So it just happened. <laughs> uh, and so here we are. <laughs> so, but when it comes to what Regina was saying, when I'm, when I heard 
Regina's interest in bringing this conversation up, I reached out to Regina after that uh, leadership uh, meeting and to ask her more in depth of which way she was going with that, like where was it going? Because I knew, me personally, I had not experienced any kind of discrimination or any kind of, you know, issues with being an African American woman when it came to the daughterhood circle or our conversations or our engagement with one another. But then when she told me it was more about the equity or lack thereof as far as what we experience going out into the healthcare world, the you know the medical support, the healthcare professionals, um, and how we receive treatment or the lack thereof. Um, now that's a conversation I can be a part of because <laughs> truly it has been a very interesting journey. Um, I've been a caregiver to my dad since 2017, but I often say I didn't know I was a caregiver until 2018. And I say that because just what you were saying, Anne, in the African American community, um, it's default, you know, that if a loved one is ill or needs, you know, taken care of, we take care of them, you know, um, and with no title, you know, we don't take on a title. And I remember sometime in 2018, um, in caring for my dad, I think he was hospitalized at his bedside. And as they were asking me, you know, what, what is your role? And I was like, I'm his daughter. And they were like, but does he live with you? You know, do you handle his medications? Are you, I was like, yeah, I said, and I'm power of attorney and everything. They were like, oh, so you're his caregiver. And I was like, am I though? <laughs> right, right. You know, and so it was this whole, you know, like just discovery of, I looked up the definition because I was really like, you know, in my head, caregivers were um, those who were paid to come in and take care of someone. I did not know what a family caregiver, I didn't know that term. I didn't know that title. All I knew is that I was taking care of my, my dad because he needed the help. Um, and so I realized that taking on that title also had resources and connections tie tied to it that would help me in the journey. Um, and so I probably took it on. Yes, I'm a family caregiver. Ask me again and I'll tell you the same. <laughs> You know, but but to Regina's point, it did come to the I, I realized that in the African American community, we don't take on that title enough to even understand that there are resources, there is support, you know, when you identify yourself as a family caregiver. Um, and, and it looks different for everyone. Like I realized that my father's care is uh, full care, you know, he's he's fully dependent on me help assisting him on a daily basis. Well, he's skilled. Okay. He's more skilled care. Yes. And so, and then you have those, uh, you know, I've met daughters in the daughterhood circle who, you know, their moms are uh, uh, very much independent, you know, and they live on their own, you know, and so the daughters are just kind of managing their affairs and everything, but they still consider themselves a family caregiver. So I've also been learning that it looks different for everybody. Um, and there's not a lot of daughters right now that I've met yet who are taking care of their father to the extent that I am. <laughs> so, you know, I, I have connected to several different caregiver support groups over these past four years. And daughterhood has been the most intimate um, for me because we are, we, again, we're all daughters. So we have this identity um, among ourselves and this um, experience that is different, you know, it's different when you're taking care of um, a, a parent who at some point had influence over your life, who at some point had authority and, and gave direction in your life. And now you are, you know, the tables have turned. Um, and so that that's a, yeah, it's, it's yeah. a very um, intimate uh, relationship to share and be able to talk about in the circle. Yeah. And I think one, sorry, Regina, go oh, ahead. No, I was just going to say, Jerry, I'm going to ask of you to write a book on daughters <laughs> taking care of fathers. Because now that my mom's gone, I'm caregiver to my dad. That's a whole nother beast. It is. Taking care of your father and your absentee father. Uh -huh. Yes. It's a whole nother, it's a whole nother story in and of itself. And I'm going to need your expertise on that. Okay, we'll write it together. 
I just got goosebumps. Like I just got goosebumps all up and down my arm, which means, which is always a sign that, that that's what you're supposed to do, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm all for it because you know, and I've been I've been journaling and recording this journey along the way because that was one way that I coped with the changes of the journey and the things that I was discovering and learning. And so, you know, very, very intentionally, I, you know, brought these two pieces of artwork to be in my background because this was a part of the journey. You know, this is a part of the artwork I did. Um, what, what? You did that? Yes. Those are your pieces? Yes. Holy smokes, those are amazing. I was gonna ask you about those. Sorry to interrupt you in this. Yeah, this what, you, those are beautiful. Yeah, so they were in 2018, my dad um, was hospitalized about eight or nine times, um, you know, health just declining. And I, you know, honestly, um, at the hands of healthcare professionals, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult for people to hear that because I know there may be healthcare professionals listening, but unfortunately, that's our story. Um, and he had been in three different care facilities in the in the year of 2018, and every care facility led to one or two hospital uh, stays. Um, and so by the end of 2018, I was bringing my dad home uh, on a stretcher connected to a feeding machine, unable to speak, um, with uh, the hospital consulting me about hospice and palliative care. Um, so they were pretty much saying that this is all he will be. Um, and, you know, to God be the glory, that's not his story. And he has um, defied the odds of everything they thought um, he wouldn't be able to do. But 2018 was uh, a year where as an artist, um, one way for me to cope in those moments of just sitting at his bedside was capturing these images and, and developing them into this work of art that really spoke to the beauty of the journey. Um, I didn't want to focus on the burden. I didn't want to focus on, you know, how it changed my life, how I had to adjust to it, but really embracing those moments that only I was experiencing and feeling honored that I was there, you know, at his bedside, that I was there to be the one to hold his hand. And, you know, in those moments where I knew he didn't know what was going on, that it was my hand he was holding. Um, so it was these moments that I was really able to capture and just, um, the series is called A Life for Life because truly I felt like I was stopping my life to save his. Yeah. Just, can I just ask you, is this artwork somewhere on the internet where yeah, people yeah, can yeah. look at it? Is it on, do you have, what's the website? Um, so I use um, Fine Art America um, and it's a website for artists to display their work. It kind of takes me out of it as far as yeah. the packaging and all of that, like Fine Art America will do all of that. Um, and so the link that Robert shared in the chat. Um, oh, there good. Is, oh, good. Okay, great. <laughs> That's one of the links that'll go to um, that that series of artwork. But again, for me, um, there were, I feel like there's a in many ways as caregivers in the African American community, there's not much empathy extended, um, especially from our elders, because it's been such a cultural thing that we do to just take care of one another, take care of our loved ones, and when they get sick. Um, you kind of get this messaging of, okay, well, just, you know, deal with it, you know, just, just you, you'll be fine. You'll be able to do it, you know? And so it's, it's a very, like, you got tough skin, you know, buckle down and get it done type thing. And so where I found um, empathy was more in the caregiver community, those who were in my shoes, those who were around the same age, you know, or, or younger, because it, I definitely have not gotten it from many elders <laughs> at all. But can at I just all. interject something? Can I interject something there? When you talk about thick skin that the elders think we have, you also have caregivers. That's what you get in your healthcare community when you're dealing with African-American cultures because clinically they feel most healthcare providers are under the assumption or the belief that African-Americans have thick skin literally that we have 
very strong nerve endings, that we have high pain tolerance, that we are um, sub, we're so faith conscious that they can deny us pain medications and, and deny us quick access to care because we are accustomed to uh, just grin and bear or just bearing the pain. And so because we've been treated like this over time and throughout time, your elders have taken that same treatment throughout life. Yeah. And so they, you know, they're no, no, they don't have any empathy because this is what they had to endure. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. they expect you to endure. And the same way your healthcare system expect you to endure, you know, you can sit out there and, you know, there, there was one, and I can't even recall this study and I almost hate to mention it because I can't recall it, but I, I remember seeing or reading um, uh, a study about, um, a physician was saying how they were trained to, for every African-American that states their pain level on a scale of one to 10, they dial it back to seven. Mm. And for every white woman or person that they, they um, dials their pain level on a scale of one to 10, they get immediate care. So because we are conditioned to take pain. So that's, and it, that's the mindset even of our own culture. So, it, I mean, it's, this, this thing is, is so diabolical, you know, it, it, it's amazing what we are conditioned to take on as caregivers. And so that's why you didn't even recognize yourself as a caregiver, because you, you don't want to be paid to take pain. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, um, okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. Anne. No, 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 no. All I was going to say was, I was just going to, I want to, don't want to forget to just prompt you on something you said to me in a while back, but that like, this is a double, there's there's two sides to this and that, this, right? all these expectations, and maybe this is where you were going, but then also there's all this wisdom in your community, like your the story about your aunt coaching you at the time you were, so I'll shut up and let you tell that story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so um, again, me being a squeaky wheel, you know, me being uh, the one to say, uh, I'm not gonna grin and bear it because I'm not, you know, one thing we know that we've seen in the African-American community is that as we have, you know, taken on the tough skin and, and grinned and bear it and, and just dealt with it, we've also lost some elders, you know, to the hands of caregiving, you know, they have, you know, uh, sacrificed themselves to the point of not taking care of themselves for the sake of taking care of someone else. And mm -hmm. that's just not my story. Uh, I, I remember being told that in early 2019, you know, me and my daughters went for checkups and the doctor was looking at my numbers and she said, your numbers look really good, surprisingly. And I said, what do you mean surprisingly? Like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just hitting 40. Like, what do you mean? I'm 44 now, but this was 2019. I was like, why, why are you surprised? And she was like, well, didn't you say you were a full-time caregiver? I said, yes. She said, well, the caregiver usually goes before the loved one. And that just echoed throughout the office. And I was just like a, 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 an African-American doctor, an African-American female doctor said those words. And I was just stunned. And I was just like, well, that won't be my story. That just won't be my story. And I just remember walking out of there with this determination that that won't be my story. Like I will make sure to take self-preservation seriously and to keep my numbers surprisingly good, you know, uh, because yeah, no, no, we're not doing that. We're yeah, not, doing not today, that. not today. Not today. <laughs> so, so it was, you know, it was, I felt it was insensitive for her to say as a doctor, but at the same time, here I am, you know, two, three years later, still repeating that statement. So it was, it echoed, it resonated, and it shifted my paradigm in that moment because no, we're not doing that for another generation. We're not going to kill ourselves taking care of our loved ones. And so um, again, I think from that point on, I did take a different look and a, a more intense look at how I was taking care of myself, my mental wellness, my emotional wellness, my spiritual wellness, knowing that the better I take care of myself, the better I can take care of my dad. And to that point that I um, 
became the squeaky wheel to my elders who I knew had taken care of uh, other loved ones and everything. And I was asking questions. And in some cases, the way they might explain it is whining. Well, okay, I'll whine. Okay, it's a squeaky wheel. <laughs> Uh, this is not something I care to do. So what's another way to do it, you know, and, and, and making sure that I wasn't straining my body, you know, I am, I had a, a lower back injury earlier in my teen years, actually. Um, and so just making sure that I uh, moved the right way in handling my dad and everything, because again, in my head, the caregiver is not going before the loved one. That's not my story. So um, I really took on a different voice after that doctor's visit. And um, uh, yes, I was lucky enough and to have my aunt, um, who is my dad's younger sister, and my mom um, be very instrumental in giving me wisdom and knowledge on some tips and things that they had learned over the years with taking care of others and just being in the medical industry. Um, my aunt was Air Force and, and medical. And then my mom has just always been in the healthcare industry. She actually retired from Emory um, Hospital. And so just with what they had seen, um, were able to tell me some things. My mom came and stayed with me for a while and showed me some things just as far as moving him around and all that type stuff. So yes, they, they were very instrumental, but still in that way of this is what you got to do. Here's the tools to do it, get it done, you know, type thing. <laughs> Ain't nobody showed up to help me, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think one of the things, and this is shifting to kind of like, there's racial inequity in this situation. And then there's also universality, which is that like, what our policymakers here in Washington do not I think remotely understand is the extent to which caregivers are asked to basically perform medical tasks. And there's that fell on to you and to you, Regina, like in terms of both oversight, but also just like, you know, having somebody at home with you, Jerry, who had a feeding tube, like, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, you had to learn a ton of medical tasks yeah. and I don't, I don't think our, I don't. And then, you know, on top of it, you're in, you're, you're also kind of fighting some of these access issues having to do with your neighborhood and getting providers to your house and things like that. And, um, and then Regina, I remember you talking about your family in the nursing home, your mom in the nursing home, and just kind of what links you had to go to to make sure she was getting. So you're all of these, these, there's like these issues that we all face that are hard that I think in some instances are really amplified for you. Like that advocacy role is harder. The access to services is harder. You know, what like you're being asked to do even more by the system. Yeah. and given less to do it with. Right, well, so even for me, when, you know, my situation definitely is not um, Jerry's situation, but it has, but I've been caring for my mom for a long time, for years, because before she became physically disabled, she was mentally disabled. So I have had the privilege of uh, caring for her for a very long time. But when we became physically disabled, and the nursing home experience, um, you know, being told that there was no Medicaid beds when there in fact was Medicaid beds. And then when I had to push back because an administrator who, you know, winked at me and said, yes, there are pushed back and I pushed back and they said, well, we have four Medicaid beds, but they're full. And, and I went back to this individual and I'm, I'm like, what do I do? I can't take her home. And she said, they have beds, you need to push back. And I, I'm a geriatric social worker, I should know this. You know, I've done this for some years now, I should know this. But when it comes home to your loved one, I don't care what you know, I don't care how much education you have, I don't care even who you know, you just stand there lost. And I was lost in, pain. I was lost in guilt. I was lost in hurt. I was lost in confusion. I didn't know what to do. And so I pushed back. I mean, I literally had to be told. So I pushed back again. And um, that 
third pushback, I was, you know, at that time, you know, I had to pull out my big guns. You know, I have a daughter that's a physician, have one that's a lawyer. Then I then I remember, oh, you are a social worker. Oh, yeah, tell them that too. So, <laughs> so I had to, I had to show up and I had to be professional, but I didn't think about it until some time. Why did it take all of that to get you to give me what was necessary? What was that that was easy? She was already there for, she had been there for almost 90 days um, for rehab. So I didn't understand why couldn't we just transition when you do have beds. So either way, yeah, I was given beds, but I, I had to do a lot of pushback. And then the abuse that entered in, you know, the two weeks without a bath. And then when I when I complained about them not getting a bath, I walked in on her being verbally abused uh, by the shower girl and then roughly handled. And then uh, when she did need pain medication, the nurse was telling her, you know, and, and this was funny that the nurse was an African-American nurse. You're, you know, you're, you're not in pain, Miss Kathy. You just here, here's a scripture. You know, they, that was her thing, giving my mom a scripture and singing over her and telling her we're stronger than that because that is the way African-Americans were raised and taught to believe that we can kumbaya our pain away, you know, and not <laughs> take, you know, medications when you need medications. And, and I am a health food nut. I'm not a pain pill person, but my mom is bone up on bone. Um, you know, she was bent over. She was no longer ambulating. She was wheelchair bound and she needed pain medication. And matter of fact, she had dementia. She wasn't even going to remember the scripture anyway. She may say, oh Lord, oh Jesus, but she wasn't going to remember uh, Jehovah Jireh. She, <laughs> she, she, she doesn't know the Jehovah's terminology anymore, you know, or the scriptures that go along with that. And so, yes, um, that fight, that warfare that we had, that I had to do on her behalf, that advocacy, um, you know, I had to just stop crying, get yourself together, girl, um, put put on your advocacy, advocacy coat, put on your big girl pants, pull <laughs> out your guns, go in there blazing. So once I had a come to Jesus meeting with the administrative staff there, talk, I actually went into the nursing home and did their in-service on how to care for her and others. Wow. And so, yes, because you just, you, I told you, I am, I'm, I'm a dementia guru. I will teach you what tone and approach is all about. And so, <laughs> yes, I went in and did, I bought them all pizza and Coke and we did an in-service to, to be nurses and on how to care for these guests, you know, and uh, got a call from the administrator and they were, you know, like, oh, you didn't have to do that. Oh, but I did. My mom is a resident here. Yeah. And not a problem and I will train your social workers anyone anyone and free of charge you know I, I this is this is on the house as long as <laughs> mom is a guest here you guys will have you know me at your disposal to show you how to do it and how to do it right and then keep put this in your put this in your note and make sure it's matriculates down to the next staff in your next turnover yeah but um, so those are the, some of the things that I had to, you know, advocate and fight for my mom once she got to the nursing home. You know, there's a whole story and life prior to um, that Jerry and I talked about offline that, you know, it's not the right time or space for that. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking, Regina, when I when I was like, this is just an hour. OK, so what pieces are we talking about? Because this could go on and on and on. Yeah, Jerry and I spent two hours um, on the phone just kind of because our, our childhood mirrored one another. And we went, at one point in time, we, we thought we might have to do a genealogy to see if we were really. <laughs> <laughs> what I will uh, say, though, Regina, one thing you mentioned as far as just engaging with the staff at the nursing home. So, uh, and you said something about, you know, needing to kind of take a breath and just, you know, talk back. And what I noticed, and I'm sure you can agree to this, is that, again, no matter what the race was in these nursing facilities, when something went wrong, they braced themselves, expecting the stereotype of the mad Black woman. 
you know, okay. you're expecting me to knock over some things. You're expecting me to like, you know, go toe to toe with someone. And that's never been my temperament, but you could tell they would brace themselves mm -hmm. for it. And so for me, as a, as a, 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 just a natural administrator and note taker and everything, I'm more like, okay, uh, what's your name? Who's your supervisor? What is their title? What's their phone? Like, I'm the person who I will take action in that aspect. I'm sending emails. I'm contacting supervisors. I'm taking note on when it happened, what day it happened, what time it happened, when I came in, what was happening when I came in. You know, so I'm a note taker and a reporter in that aspect. Something will change and you'll know that I was upset, but I'm not the mad black woman. Well, I'm going to do that. And I'm not the mad black woman, but I do make noise. I do. I go to administrate. I want to see change after I, after I got out of my feelings and my mom was not able to speak up because regardless to who you think my mom is or what you think my mom deserves, she was my mother. Yeah. And you were going to care for her. And not only that, she was human because I, I advocated for the man across the hall who was white, who was yelling all night, who disturbed other people's rest, who was hungry, who had on socks with no grips and he was on a walker and he was going to slip and fall. Where is his grip socks? Where is the nurse? You know, so it wasn't just her. I, I, I made noise yeah. for every guest patient client that came into my path that's just me I, if i if i see it wrong i will clear the atmosphere <laughs> so you know just because i can now that i know that i can i will yeah no. <laughs> and I, I found that i i, I had done that several times of just understanding the burden you mm -hmm. know and something you had brought up as far as the nursing facilities being um you know, minimally staffed. They're not staffed and they're very overworked. And so there were plenty of times where I came in to check on my dad in 2018 and knowing, you know, that this one young lady had the whole floor, you know, mm -hmm. of needing to get everybody out of their bed, get them showered, get them dressed. And, you know, so here it is 11 o'clock, my dad is still in the bed undressed. And I would say, okay, you don't have to worry about him. I'll take care of him, you know, hopefully you can get everybody else done, but I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm capable and I'm able and I'm here. So no, I'm not going to stand and wait for you to get yeah, to my no, dad because no. he may just be a name on your list, but he's my dad. And so I'll get him dressed and we'll get to our little activities down on the, in the lobby, you know, <laughs> and you can go on with the next person on your list. Um, but just understanding what that looks like for the staff, I was very uh, aware that um, they're overworked. They're overworked. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to talk to some of them and know what they were getting paid, which was nickels, you know, nickels. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, so they're expecting you to shower and change you know, grown people and um, deal with them kicking and biting and cussing you and um, even uh, speaking racial slurs, you know, mm -hmm. because of course we know one thing with dementia is that, you know, the cuss no words filter. are always there. No and, filter. You know, the, the racial slurs and, you know, just some of the things that they were dealing with, you know, and again, you, I think when it comes to what you were saying, Regina, about just the, the underdog, because we are a race of minority, we very often will extend empathy to whoever's being mistreated because absolutely. we know what that feels like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I can totally see that. But I, I think the two of you are especially special, empathetic people. <laughs> like, I mean, you bring your, you bring so much soul to everything that you do, and and that's. Um, and that's evident. And so, you know, everybody who crosses your path is really lucky. And um, whether they're the care, formal paid caregivers or the facility staff or whoever, you know, you made me think of something though, like um, I am, I personally, I'm also, I mean, even as a white person, I'm struggling with how to manage how, you know, providers perceive me and maybe this is a gender thing is like just the mad daughter, you know, so like I call this physician's office and I'm like, why is that my dad? Like every time he goes, no, he never sees a doctor. 
I feel like they're just like, he's this, you know, 80 something year old man. They're just kind of like, it got him on this, you know, like revolving door thing. And he's not seeing the actual doctor. He doesn't know what to expect. And I get upset. And then, and then I'm not sure that helps. Like, I'm not sure he got better care because I called up because I, when I called up, I was upset. Like I was, I was not in control of my emotions. And, you know, I think I'm interested in your advice. Like how do people, what's your advice about how to, unfortunately, how to manage that? Unfortunately, and I think people with dementia, debilitating diagnosis, I don't care what your ethnicity, background, culture is, race, they don't even have to ever see you. You can just call the office, period. You have a Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, any of those, those are irreversible diseases diagnosed. Mm -hmm. You're only going down. You're not coming up. That's right. Right. You may plateau out for, you can live in those, with those diseases for a minute, but your ultimate space is down, you know, you're going to decline. And so a physician, uh, to me, this is just my own personal opinion. I think they see that, they find out where you are in that process, and that's how they move forward with you. If you're stable and, and all is well in your world, then we get you right in. It's all about medicine tweaking. They don't need to see you to tweak your medication. They can do that via phone, via nurse practitioner, uh, office girl, pharmacy, you know what I mean? Uh, yep. Because that's all, that's all they're going to do is tweak your medicine. Um, they're not treating the loved one. They're not treating you. They're not treating your mom. Right. They're not uh, looking at your, they're not looking at your dad holistically, meaning they're not looking at those that care for him and support him. They're only looking at him and his diagnosis and what, um, Med, meds he's on whether to take it up take it down add it take it away and that's all they go and if he had a fall they're going to look at that to see if it shifted something here or if it broke something you know and that's that's it and that's, it. that's our healthcare system that is our healthcare system and that's how you whether they that are that is exactly what was happening you just described it perfectly the doctor doesn't need to see him because it, it was chemo it's like do we need just more of this or more of that? But meanwhile, my dad was like, I don't understand what's going on. I don't know what to expect. Like, you know, well, and I said to the doctor. You as the worry wart, yeah. you're just the worry daughter because you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're looking at. They're the expert of the disease. Your dad is living with the disease that he's just going to have to get used to. And you are too. Unfortunately, yeah. that, I, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's awful but that is truly 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 what i believe the mindset and the heart set of our health care that's I, that's the way they leave you feeling and i've had that conversation because for my dad you know we're, we're talking about you know um neurology and mm -hmm. you know he's seizure prone and you know things of that nature and so you know it he when he was initially discharged into my care um, he was on about eight different meds, um, six of which were seizure management. And over the time of me caring for him, um, and it really kind of uh, was random and, and I didn't do it on purpose, but, you know, there were a couple of times where one med ran out before I could, you know, get it refilled or get it back in. But in the midst of him being off of a med while we were waiting for it to come in, um, he got a little more alert, you know, he was a little bit more responsive. And so not that I was trying to do these little test runs, but it was like, well, if he's doing better without it, then do we need to introduce this back into his system? And so that wind up being some of the conversations that I was having with the neurologist. And it got to the point where they were just listening to me. So you want to take them off of that? Okay, no problem. And it's just like, well, what the hell? Why am I even, what are you here for? And so I got to a point where it was like, okay, so you guys are just prescription writers, pretty much. Right. So it's whatever I say goes. Okay, no problem. I get it. I get it. Okay. 
So you want the copay and you want to know what I want to be different about my dad. All right, no problem. I get it now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there have been so many truths uttered on this one phone call. <laughs> I've been writing down some notes of like, we're going to have, we're going to make a whole bunch of quote posters out of things that you guys have been saying. <laughs> because the one thing I hear from daughters is there's like one of two things like, like, I cannot, but one of the big ones is I cannot believe that I am in charge of all of this. And it sounds like you, Jerry, it's almost like you've gone through these stages, like where you're like, maybe that's where you started. And now you're in this place of, all right, I am in charge and I get it. Right. And just, you know, and I think another surprise as far as the stereotype is that um, I feel like healthcare professionals expect us by stereotype to be ignorant of what they're saying or yeah. what they are um, suggesting for our parents or our loved ones. And so I ran into that as well, as far as just the transition of neurologists, you know, one neurologist was being promoted to the hospitalist. And so my dad's file was getting transferred to someone else. And so you would think that on that first initial visit, you have done your homework, you've read my dad's files, you know where we are in his process. And that was not the case. And so, you know, you go in and they're telling me, well, this is what we're gonna do. Well, no, we're not, we're not. Because um, what his history is and where he is now, no, we're not going back to that. There's a reason why he's no longer on that medication. And so really just having to stand in what I know is true for my dad um, and what I have experienced. Like, you guys aren't there. You, you don't see the difference. And having to really explain that and advocate as far as like, no, that med sedates him. You know, he doesn't, you know, respond well. We're not going back to that. And again, that was something, again, that my, my mom, you know, my aunt empowered me um, to say. They, they, they reminded me that you don't have to accept any medication that they prescribe to him. As his power of attorney, you can always say, we decline. And mm-hmm. that was, it was small, wow. but it was empowering. And for me to know that, okay, thanks for that. Because yeah, I don't think from my experience of being with him on a daily basis, that med is not good for him. Mm-hmm. So right. what else are we going to do? You know, um, and really just being able to make some of those decisions. So it has been empowering over time. The more I've learned, the more knowledge I've, I've come into and understanding his condition and how it affects him. Yes, I've been able to advocate and really wow. stand in my voice of what's best for him. Yeah, you stand in really knowledge truly is power. It is. In our healthcare system. Yeah. And you, uh, you didn't, you, I mean, most of that knowledge you have gained yourself. I mean, you have, it's, you tell a story about when that, that time your dad's being discharged from the hospital and on a feeding tube and they were just like, here you go. Nobody trained you. You had to ask for the training on how to even use it and clean it. Yes. Yes. And again, I would have known to ask that my aunt (laughs) who (laughs) knew that he was being discharged into my care. One of her last conversations um, as a veteran herself, because he was at the VA hospital, she was like, you know, ask for everything, you know, as far as the equipment, the supplies, ask for everything. She said some things they're not going to mention to you and they won't provide unless you ask for it. So that was one big thing that she said. And then she said, don't leave. She said, they can't push you out the door if you're not ready. She said, don't leave until you know how to use all of the equipment and that you have all the supplies. And, um, you know, the feeding feeding machine was very intimidating um, to know that I was going to have to be responsible for flushing it and changing the bags. And, you know, you're talking about these packets of milk and it's like, okay, does it have to be refrigerated? Like what does, I I know milk to be refrigerated. So what, you know, it was just so many little pieces. He also had a bed sore that had developed at one of the nursing facilities he was in. So I became a wound care nurse, you know, his physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, uh, dietitian, you know, overnight, overnight. 
Um, they had plenty of supplies for me by the time I left because again, my aunt was very aware of his condition and was kind of listing off to me, make sure you ask for this, make sure you ask for that. So they had a cart just as big as his stretcher full of supplies and cases. Um, and it was just like, okay, so who's gonna, when are we gonna go through this training? Because the supplies were at the door they were transferring my dad to the to the stretcher out of the hospital bed. And I'm just like, so, but who's going to train me? And I went to the nursing station, like, y'all need to get the dietitian, the wound care nurse. Like, I need to know what these supplies are for, how I'm supposed to use it, how often Where'd do they I, go? <laughs> how often do I flush them? Do they go in? <laughs> you know, it was just, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, I, it was a squeaky unbelievable thing for sure. That's a really, it's a very powerful story um, about, you know, what, what we're really, what we're all dealing with, yeah. you know, and in the system. And so I just want to say that an hour just went by wow. <laughs> like that. I think everybody on this call can understand why I just, I mean, I just love talking to you all. And I always come away feeling um, just like I've really learned a lot. So. Um, I just, yeah, I, you know, we don't, I just want to say thank you so much for, for doing this, for just, for taking up this, you know, uh, taking up the mantle and choosing to lead. I think both of you, you're just going to lead. Like you just, it's just part of you, you are, you, you know, like it, you see a gap and you walk into it. It's just obvious to me. And I just, I really want to just say, I, I, I think there's been so much that you've said in just this last hour that as I've been listening, we can, we can turn into messaging for the African-American community and frankly, for the whole caregiver community. There's so much universality. And, you know, I think anybody who's listened to this is going to feel less alone anybody of any race good that, that's our hope that's our hope we just you don't walk alone right you, walk alone. you do not walk alone and yeah. that's and then, that and is the feeling there's resources out you know there are resources out there and you know again as we talked before some unfortunately may not be available in your local community um but continue to search continue to look and um, know that that, again, one thing about the African-American community, because of the disparities and the things that we haven't had access to, we are a very um, uh, uh, unique and, and uh, we, we invent things, we come up with ideas, you know, to make sure we can care for our loved ones. So in that aspect, um, we'll, we'll find a way, that's for sure. That's for sure. You know, and, and, and don't be afraid to cross those those bear those lines. You know, I mean, if you can't find it in the African American community, come on over to the other side. It's it, there's there's care over there. That's what I found out. I got better care when I learned to blend my network instead of looking for the help in one location. I have a plethora of resources and there is not in one community it's in a vast community and so you know i i'm so thankful that i'm here i'm connected and i'm resourced <laughs> yes indeed yes indeed i just want to say thank you thank you thank you thank you once again you guys were amazing amazing i didn't i just really my halfway through, I was like, I just need to mute and just shut up and let. No, no. Because <laughs> you guys had got it. So we didn't uh, talk about anything we practiced. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna do this again. This is we're gonna do this again. Uh, I think we should. And um, so let's talk about that. And I just thanks to everybody who joined us and for being such a great listening audience. And uh, we're gonna put this up on YouTube and. It's going to be amazing. And uh, so let me wrap it up there and say thanks. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks for coming. Bye. Thank you, Ann. Bye. Bye. We got to start writing, girl. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Bye.